Well, good morning. God's peace to you. It's wonderful to be with you this morning, and I pray that you're blessed for being here in this place. Today we're going to talk about, in our study of the Imago Day being made in God's image, we're going to talk about the sacredness, the meaningfulness of life. Life matters. Sometimes we, we lose sight of that. Sometimes we wonder if there's any purpose to life at all. But the constant theme ringing throughout the scriptures is that life, in fact, does matter. But it might not be exactly as we think of it. Look at what Jesus teaches us in Luke chapter 17, there in verse 33. Jesus says, I tell you, whoever tries to make his life secure will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. This is one of those paradoxical sayings of Jesus. You know, he liked to talk like that. The, the last shall be first. The first shall be last. Right? The, the greatest will be the servant of all. This is another one of those paradoxes in Jesus' teaching. When we set out to secure our life, it's that moment that we actually lose life. Or at least we lose what matters about life. How many people are busy going about to secure their lives? In fact, some whole industries are designed to create a sense of security. You've got your insurance industry, right? And they'll sell you insurance for anything. You can get everything insured in your home. You can get your vehicles insured. I was told that at one point, a particular uh, movie star had her legs insured so that uh, if anything happened to her legs, uh, she would be able to recover the losses in earned wages. You can insure almost anything these days. And there's whole industries dedicated to retirement planning and investing so that as we get older, we have everything financially secure. And no doubt there is some wisdom and prudence in having insurance coverage, health insurance, things like that, life insurance. If you have dependents, obviously there's some prudence and wisdom there. There's some wisdom in investing for retirement even. But when it comes to what really matters in life, if that's what our security is based on, we maybe have missed what life is ultimately all about. I want to go to Luke chapter uh, 16 there in verse 21. I think that might actually be the wrong passage. Let's see here. No, no. Luke chapter 16. I'm going to begin reading actually in, uh, in verse 19. Here scripture says, there was a rich man who would dress in purple and fine linen, feasting lavishly every day. But a poor man named Lazarus, covered with swords, was lying at his gate. He longed to be filled with what fell from the rich man's table. But instead, the dogs would come and lick his sores. One day, the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he looked up and saw Abraham's lo uh, Abraham uh, a long way off with Lazarus at his side. Father Abraham, he called out, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this flame. Son, Abraham said, remember that during your life you received your good things just as Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here while you are in agony. Besides all this, a great chasm has been fixed between us and you so that those who want to pass over from here to you cannot. Neither can those from there cross over to us. Father, he said, then I beg you to send him to my father's house. Because I have five brothers to warn them so that they won't also come to this place of torment. 
But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. But he told them, he told him, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. This story is very interesting. Obviously, Jesus is sharing this story to make a point. It's, it's similar to his parabolic teaching. There's a pinprick point, a target that he is aiming at. And of course, the message is quite clear. If we just step back and ask, what is the point of this story? Well, you might get everything you want in this life. But if you miss out on Jesus, if you miss out on the hope of eternal life, you've missed everything. In fact, Jesus makes this point over and over throughout the scriptures. In Luke chapter 12, he talks about a man who was so wealthy and so successful in farming, probably would make the farmers around here jealous because he had so much that he had to build extra barns to hold all of his harvest. And he built these barns and he stored up everything that he had. And then he said to himself in Luke chapter 12, there... In verse 19, he says, Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. Right? This is the guy who invested for retirement well. He's been successful. He has secured himself financially. And so he thinks he's got it made in the shade. Only the rest of the story says, But God said to him, You fool. This very night, your life is demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Whose will they be? And then Jesus explains, this is how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You see, we've been given this beautiful gift of life. Remember when God created us in Genesis chapter 2? Verse 7, Scripture says, He breathed into the man the breath of life, and he became a living soul, a living being. That life is precious. It's meaningful. It matters. And we can waste that life on things that are not important eternally. We can have all the riches that this world has to provide, but if we're not rich toward God, God says to us, you fool. You fool. Now, throughout the Bible, we see this repeated again and again. One other encounter in Jesus' life and ministry we find in Matthew cha or Mark chapter 10, rather, uh, beginning there in verse 17. Scripture says, as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up, knelt before him, and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, he's asking the right question, isn't he? Unlike the rich fool in Luke chapter 12, unlike the rich man uh, in Luke chapter 16, who had not even a consciousness, awareness, any intention to be rich toward God, to think about eternal things, this young man... He's good, and he's desiring the good things of God. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But then as we go on, we see in verse 18, Jesus responds, why do you call me good? And Jesus asked him, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And this is what the young man said to him. Teacher, I have kept all of these from my youth. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, read through those commandments again with me. Do not commit murder. Okay, check. Do not commit adultery. All right, check. Do not steal, check. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud, honor father and mother. Could you say to Jesus, teacher, I have kept all these from my youth. 
Well, he could. And because of that, in verse 21, Scripture says, Mark's gospel says, looking at him, Jesus loved him. Looking at him, Jesus loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. So you're good on all that. That's great. But you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Well, there you go. He got the answer to his question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Surely this young man would be rejoicing to finally know that he can have eternal life. He can inherit this wonderful gift of not just life here on earth, but life eternally. But if you read the next verse, the story takes a tragic turn. It says, but he was dismayed by this demand. And he went away grieving because he had many possessions. Now, there's no other way to slice it. This young man, like a lot of us today, we have plenty of this world's goods. Rich. He had many possessions. Other translations say his possessions were great. And there's just no other way to slice it. He valued those things more than he valued eternal life. That's why he was dismayed. That's why he went away grieving because he knew he couldn't have his cake and eat it too. He knew he couldn't continue to live a life focused on earthly possessions and inherit eternal life because that would require sacrificing what mattered to him most. And that's really the deal, isn't it? If you want to live a life that matters, a life that reflects the sacred gift that was given to you by God when he breathed the breath of life into your nostrils, if you want to live a life that matters, then nothing in this life can matter to you more than your relationship with God. If it does, like this young rich ruler, you will go away dismayed and grieving. We oftentimes put other things before what is the ultimate thing in our life. The book of Esther tells this beautiful story. Some people don't think it's a beautiful story, but I do. I think it's a beautiful story. Now, it's got some dark sides to it for sure. It's coming in from a culture that sometimes we, we look back and we think, how do people live like that? It was terrible. But in the midst of this dark and terrible situation emerges a very beautiful story and a story about a beautiful girl. But what's beautiful about the story isn't that the girl is beautiful. That's just part of the story. She wins essentially what was considered a beauty contest of sorts. And she is taken into King Artaxerxes' harem. She becomes a queen. It's the stuff Disney movies are made out of. Except Disney would clean it up a little bit. The truth is it wasn't so glamorous to be a queen in King Artaxerxes' harem because the last queen got her head taken off. It didn't go so well for her. So Hester's in this unique, privileged, and precarious situation. And as the story goes... Esther finds out that there is a plot to destroy the Jews, her people. And she goes to her uncle Mordecai and she says, what are we going to do? I, I, this is terrible. And he's saying, you know what? You need to act. But she can't do anything. She can't even enter the king's presence without being summoned. And if she does, she could end up like the previous queen. 
which wasn't that long ago. And yet, this is what the Bible says in Esther chapter 4. It's actually verse 14, I think. Esther chapter 4, verse 14. Mordecai says to her, If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place. Relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people for another place. God's going to work out his plans. Mordecai's looking back on the promises of God to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's looking to how God has worked to bring about his promises so far. And he's confident that, you know, no matter what threats may exist to the Jewish people, God's going to be faithful. And yet, he says to Esther, but you and your father's family will be destroyed. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. So often we think about our lives as meaningless, pointless. We're just dust in the wind, just water under the bridge. But our lives do matter. They matter when we are faithful to where we are and what we're called to be in that moment. No matter how big or small we may judge that, life matters when we're faithful because God rejoices in our faithfulness. Well, the queen, under threat of death, enters the king's presence and intercedes on behalf of her people, saves her people. And in her faithfulness to the moment, God is glorified. There's another story in the Old Testament from the book of Daniel. Daniel's a book about the people of Israel who are exiled in Babylon. And Daniel is one of many young men who were taken captive when Israel was plundered and, and overcome by the Babylonians. So Daniel and, and others like him, young men, strong young people, were all chosen and brought back to Babylon to be in exile. Now Daniel's friends, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, have a little part in Daniel's story. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, he erects this golden image. And at certain times of the day, there's going to be a, a, an alert that everyone should stop what they're doing and bow down to this idol, this golden image, which put Jewish people like Daniel and his three friends in a predicament, didn't it? The Bible says in Daniel chapter 3, verse 16, that these, these folks, Shadrach, Meshach, and, and Abednego, decided the moment called for their faithfulness. Daniel chapter 3, verse 16 says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer to this question. If the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire and he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. They put their faith in God. They trusted in the true God, not the false God that King Nebuchadnezzar had put up and demanded they worship. And they stood before the king and they refused to bow down. The reason? Because their God could rescue them. But verse 18 is even more impressive. Scripture says, but their response says, but even if he does not rescue us, we want to, you as king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. They were prepared to be thrown into the fire as Nebuchadnezzar demanded of those who didn't bow down. They said, fine, go ahead. Because we refuse. We're only going to bow down to the true God, not this false idol. And we believe our God can rescue us, but if he doesn't, 
we still will not bow down. Now, you know the story perhaps, right? They believed in the right God. And this God did choose to rescue them. The God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, preserved them through the fiery furnace to the astonishment of Nebuchadnezzar and everyone else. And God was glorified. But I just think, wow, what if the story had gone the other way? Well, God would still have been glorified because those three boys were not going to bow down and they were going to maintain their faithfulness no matter what. It's an amazing thing to realize that our lives matter. In Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, you remember the story how uh, Scrooge, Ebenezer Scrooge, is confronted by his business partner who has passed and come back as a ghost, rattling the chains of his torture and torment because he lived his life for nothing that mattered. And he's coming to Ebenezer to remind him and to warn him and to give him a chance to change his course so he doesn't end up in the same fate as Marley. And through the course of Dickens' story, Scrooge gets an opportunity to see what his life has been, what it is, and what it will be if he continues on the course he's, he's currently headed. And after that experience, he's transformed and he realized that the things he thought mattered don't really matter. What really matters are those things that are eternal. Those things that go beyond the earthly, the temporal. And he started to give away his great possessions to invest and lay up treasure in heaven. Listen to what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6. This is astonishing. We, we often read this text with a, a view to how God takes care of us. But I want to notice something here. Matthew chapter 6, beginning there in verse 25. Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body or what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly father feeds them. And listen to this now. Aren't you worth more than they? God created all life and he takes care of the birds the sparrows the lilies of the field he's going to take care of us and we hear that message from Jesus but Jesus bases that message on a comparison between how much more your life matters than a flower or even a bird why is that? Well, it's because of what we've been talking about over the series of these messages. It's because we were created in God's image. The Imago Dei is within us to reflect God and who he is in our lives. That's what matters. It matters more than food or clothing. Now, the humanist society will tell you that there's a hierarchy of needs and you can't expect people to worry about things like, you know, law and order or even altruistic things, goodness, relationships, love. You can't expect that until their basic needs are met. They got to have security, food, water, shelter. Only then can you expect people to be human. That's probably the main reason I'm not a humanist. 
Because the Bible says we are human, made in God's image from the moment we are conceived. We bear the image of God. And it doesn't matter if we have enough to eat or if our clothes are rags. It doesn't matter if we have security and shelter. Sometimes people in those situations demonstrate more goodness and love and mercy than people who have it made in the shade. Sometimes people in desperate situations can demonstrate the image of God far better than those in affluent situations. Now, it doesn't mean that being in a desperate situation is good. It's not. And if we care about people, we want to help them to have those things. But it's not what life is all about. It. Are you not worth more than those things? More than those other things that God cares so much about? He can care about you as well. Because you are so so valuable. Finally, again, Jesus teaches us from Matthew's gospel in Matthew chapter 16, the proper order of what matters in life. There in verse 26, Jesus says, Matthew 16, verse 26, for what will it benefit someone if he gains the whole world yet loses his life? Or what will anyone give in exchange for his life? The uh, Old King James and many other translations render that word life, soul. Just like in Genesis, we became a living soul. You can't take it with you. And while you're here in this life, if you're not rich toward God, if you're not focused on inheriting eternal life through the grace of God and Jesus Christ, you may get everything you want here and it will be your ruin. I'll never forget listening to the testimony of a pastor's wife in Louisiana who shared how she had fallen through adultery, through infidelity and been restored to her husband and to God. But in her testimony, what stood out to me is that she said the problem wasn't that her husband was a bad husband. He was a good husband. He was a faithful man. He was a good pastor. The problem was he couldn't give her everything she needed. He couldn't save her from her problems, her weaknesses, her failings. There's a good reason for that. His name was not Jesus. And many people like this pastor's wife begin to think that marriage and a partner is our salvation. Or they think a career and a, a big name in the world or they think having an easy life where they have all that security financially, whatever it is, they think that's going to be the thing that makes everything else okay. And we begin to have an idol in our lives. And an idol has one major flaw. It's not real. It cannot hold up to the promise. It cannot bear the burden that we are putting on it. He could not save his wife from her challenges, from her sins. And there's nothing in this world that can bear the burden of our salvation. Salvation is in the Lord because he's the one who bears our burdens. He bore them all the way up Calvary's hill and he bore them on that old rugged cross so that we could truly be free. So that we could have life and have it more abundantly. So today I would encourage you to think about the fact that you are in a, a creature made in the image of God. And that and that alone means that you matter. 
Your life matters. Don't waste it. Maybe you're in a tough spot like Esther and you don't know what to do. Do what matters. For now and for eternity. Maybe you're like the three Hebrew children who stood before Nebuchadnezzar and said, we're going to choose the true God, not the false God. Do what matters because you matter. Your life matters. In the big things and in the small things. Let's pray together. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you. We praise you for all that you are. And we ask you to lift us up in the midst of this life, which can be full of joys and full of sorrows, can be full of triumphs and full of hardships. Help us to see how you care for the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. Help us to realize that we made in your image are so much more valuable that life matters. It matters now and it matters forever. Help us not to waste our lives on things that will not matter eternally. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus who showed us a way that transcends the false gods and the meaningless things of this life and transforms everything into your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.